Uh, I just want to briefly talk about the EGFR mutant. Uh, what do you do in this situation? This comes up more often than you think. And uh, so this is a patient. Uh, this is actually a real patient of mine, uh, a clinical research assistant at Washington University who actually presented with cough, found to have a stage two disease. And uh, when we did the molecular analysis, she had exon 19 deletion, completed four cycles of adjuvant therapy. Now the question really is, what do you do? Do you give them? Assume for a minute the alchemist trial doesn't exist. And uh, so what would you do off trial um, in this patient if you see such a patient in the clinic? Great. So I just want to spend five, ten minutes to talk about what we know, where we are going with this. And the whole idea of adjuvant therapy is to cure patients. That's as simple as that. You know, we are not just delaying the recurrence. The, the real thing is to eradicate. We were discussing yesterday at the FDA what should be the ideal endpoint for these trials. And there was more or less a consensus, uh, at least so I thought, uh, that overall survival should be the endpoint, not just the disease-free survival. And uh, that's important. And plus, that should come without uh, significant toxicities. And this is very tempting. When you see things like that, how can that not be bad? You want to give it to these patients. But remember one thing. By cancer, in a way, is nothing more than evolution, compressed instead of millions of years, compressed over 10, 15 years. So in fact, uh, there are wonderful papers written recently. The more we study the genomic alterations in cancer, we come to appreciate the genomic diversity of cancer is very similar to what Darwin wrote in a piece of paper, how these things evolve. It is identical. In fact, we have not seen nothing. In fact, they always say nothing in science makes uh, any sense unless it's seen in the context of evolution that is so true for cancer. And as these tumors evolve, and there is a lot of selection pressure in the way the tumors evolve. That's why you have some tumors go to the brain, some go to the lung, and some go to the bones, and uh, tissue factors modify this. So the tumors are constantly sculpted, at least the genomic architecture is sculpted constantly by this intrinsic random evolution of these uh, genomic alterations. And then suddenly comes along this massive pressure induced by treatment. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't treat cancer patients and don't take it to this logical extreme, but the point is the treatment in turn, what happens, puts in selection pressure and then changes the course in ways that sometimes we can predict, sometimes we cannot predict. So especially with targeted therapies, one issue always would be treating some of these slow-growing clones by treating them aggressively. Are you going to eradicate and promote the development of more resistant clones? That may be somewhat theoretical. Fortunately, so far, we have not seen a compelling evidence that's happening rapidly in a short time. But it's very important to keep in mind that how can this not hurt? This can positively hurt. And we saw that evidence of that in stage 3 setting when we gave gefitinib to all kinds of patients. And so it's important to keep in mind and don't be persuaded by this. And I'll just briefly mention two studies that have addressed this issue of uh, adlotinib in uh, in, a, in EGFR mutant patients or in the post-operative setting. And this is the phase two ran, non-randomized single arm study, uh, what is called SELECT study, uh, led by Alicia Sequest. A number of us participated in this. Patients with resected non-small cell lung cancer, if they have EGFR mutant disease, they got uh, a lotinib and um, followed by observation. And these patients could have got some chemotherapy as a part of a standard adjuvant treatment. And then they went on a lotinib uh, for two years and then uh, were observed. And uh, if you look at the two-year disease-free survival, it's about 90%. It's fairly good. But again, you have to keep in mind that this is a small study, single arm, and we don't have a comparator here, obviously, and the follow-up is relatively short. But what we can learn from this study is that how well this is tolerated. And um, the answer is it's about the same as what you see in a metastatic disease setting. You do see a number of grade 1 toxicities, but the severe toxicities are fairly low except for skin rash, and that can be quite bothersome in some patients. But the important point is that how many of them were able to take this, how many of them had to have dose reduction. It, it, there is a significant number, as you can see here, about 16%, whose doses have to be reduced, not one, but two level to 50 milligram. And, but the good number of patients, uh, nearly two-thirds of them, could go on without dose reduction of full doses. And if you look at the uh, treatment duration, and 11% uh, were not able to take it beyond a month or so, and um, a good portion of, good number of the patients, nearly 70% were able to continue nearly two years. And... Um, for some reason, some patients continued beyond two years, but then you could get 
most of your patients to two years of therapy, two thirds of them, and a small number would fall off earlier on. And um, one of the concerns is that could we ever cure patients with oncogenic tumors? In other words, can you eradicate this population? That answer is unknown, not only in lung cancer, but also, in my opinion, other cancers as well. And so, predictably, if you extend that argument, once you stop the drug, you should be seeing recurrence because, after all, you're not eradicating these things. And there is some suggestion that that may be happening, and I think fairly soon these patients seem to recur once you stop them. Actually, if you go back as a comparison, the one study that I could think of right now is the one that we did several years ago where we looked at 1,000 patients, stage 1 lung cancer. We followed them for many years, and we reported that uh, four or five years ago. If you look at the survival in those patients, um, it's about 78% or so, but then median time to progression was about a year and a half. In other words, even in stage one patients, when they recur, they recur within a couple of years. And when you go for three and a half years or so, then you stop, and then uh, uh, two, two years or so, and you stop, but then a little bit soon they recur. It makes me think that these patients have a growing tumor because they have come off the EGFR TK inhibitor in these instances. And uh, so the, that raises the question whether we should continue a longer time, and that's very hard to argue at the moment. And so the two questions uh, that would be asked in the coming years, do these drugs help at all? And second, what's the optimal duration of therapy if they help? And that's something only time would sort out. So the one important lesson we learned from select trial is, yes, it's feasible to give postoperatively 70% can get it for nearly two years, and that's the most important message from the SELECT trial. You cannot draw too much conclusions from the efficacy. The RADIANT trial was, uh, was a good trial, except that it was somewhat poorly designed, and uh, it asked an important question. Should we give a lot in a postoperatively, a large phase three global study with nearly 1,000 patients? The sad part of it is that uh, they really was a bit... Uh, uh, somewhat ambitious in the sense they took anybody with EGFR positive in those days with IHC. It was not selected. If this were an EGFR mutant population, this question would have been answered. We would know what to do at this point. Unfortunately, they took anybody who had some EGFR positivity um, and uh, or IHC or FISH. The bar is very low, and we know today in 2015, both are poor markers to select patients for EGFR inhibitor. So basically, you should read it as all comers. That's the way I would look at it. And the adjuvant therapy, they got, um, they actually got uh, a lot of placebo. They were stra the patients either had adjuvant therapy or no adjuvant therapy, and they were stratified based on the histology stage and the adjuvant therapy. The bottom line is, in this group of patients, poorly selected arguably, and a lot in did not make a difference. Uh, again, the median duration of therapy, if I'm not mistaken, was two months, I mean, two years. And uh, the side effects, uh, once again, there were more side effects with erlotinib over placebo. As you can see here, rash was present common. Placebo also had some rash, interestingly. And the significant rash was obviously more common in the erlotinib patient. Everything else was more or less, uh, less than 5 to 10 percent, as you saw with the select study. And uh, no patient had significant ILT. The duration of therapy, very similar to the select study, was about 22 months, the median duration of therapy, and some took it only for a few weeks, and major, a good number of them seemed to have gone on for quite some time, at least for a year or longer. Unlike the select study, uh, the number of patients who were on 22 months or so, it's about 40, 45 percent, and, um, and this, this happens in larger phase three study, but, uh, but clearly you get a sense of how well patients handle this. But the interesting question is that how did patients with EGFR mutant uh, cancer do with erlotinib? And here you can see, if you look at the disease-free survival, there was a big difference. The top curve is the erlotinib, and the bottom one is placebo. And you can see that there was a big difference in, uh, in the disease-free survival, and that is quite significant. That was not the primary endpoint. And, um, and the overall survival was not that much different, but the data are fairly mature. The events are very small. And remember, it's not the total number of patients, the events that matter. And so the follow-up from this will be very interesting, and we will have that before the Alchemist trial, so that will be interesting. And this, at least, the one uh, comfort I take from the Radian study is this, that it didn't show an adverse effect. There was a concern that there was some adverse um, effect induced by gefitinib in the post-op setting in the uh, Canadian study. And in fact, that was one of the final nails that uh, hit the coffin of gefitinib then. And um, uh, the, 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 the fact that the 
Those, those were unselected group of patients, but here in the EGFR mutant patients, we saw no hint of any adverse outcomes, and that some of us feared for the reasons I told you for selection pressure. So we didn't see that. That's good. But the important thing for you to keep in mind is that um, the radiant trials are not definitive results because it's not an EGFR mutant population. The number of EGFR mutant patients are very small and just about 100 plus, and uh, we need a lot more patients, and so that's why I think we need to design a specific study for this. And this is the Alchemist study, full disclosure, I'm one of the principal investigators, and, um, and in fact, uh, this is a very ambitious effort. The idea is not just doing the EGFR testing, create an infrastructure to test these novel agents in the adjuvant setting, as after all, the pharma companies spend more, most of their energy in the metastatic disease setting, the adjuvant trials take 10 to 20 years, so this is an effort by the NCI to move the field forward. And uh, we're going to do two things, not only test the agents as they come along, so this will be expanded, and the second one is we're going to take the tumor samples and we'll be doing the genomic analysis to fully understand uh, all the alterations that are present. And uh, as I said earlier on this morning, it would take several thousand patients to be analyzed to find those low frequency variants that could potentially be targeted, and that's the whole idea of doing this. And uh, the, the, the structure it is at the moment is that there are three parts to this. You have a screening trial, 8,000 patients will be screened, and your local tests are fine, but there'll be a central test and there'll be a confirmation to see concordance, and uh, that'll be a screening. So you can screen anybody who would potentially qualify for the screening trial for this. You can do this during the initial evaluation when you give adjuvant therapy, and, um, and once they have EGF or mutant positive, they can go to their Lartanib trial, if they're ALK positive, they can go to the Crisodium trial. The samples can be sent to a central lab, and uh, you'll, get, you'll get credit for putting patients on the screening trial, and you'll be notified of the results of these uh, mutation uh, testing. And um, you can do this preoperatively or postoperatively, so this is a fairly flexible study, and it's fairly easy to accrue. It's open in about 700 centers, and we've had a, a couple of hundred patients screened. And it's, a, it's a, the design already I've talked about. Uh, the primary endpoint is overall survival. The patients will get two years of therapy. And it's fairly straightforward as long as they have a complete resection. Close margins, margins positive won't qualify for. They can get chemo or chemo radiation or nothing based on your decisions. And uh, these patients can go on this trial. And uh, this is a very straightforward design, as I said, two years and plus for two years and then the long-term follow-up. Same with ALK. And um, we're going to have about 6,000 to 8,000 patients screening arm, about 400 patients in each of the alchemist treatment arms so that we can really uh, find out is there a significance. We're looking for a hazard ratio of 0.67, so this is clinically quite meaningful, and uh, so many people have worked on this for so many years to make this happen, and hopefully uh, we will see the studies to completion. And more recently, there is going to be this immunotherapy arm that's going to be introduced as well, where patients will get an EVO or placebo. And so remember, we are asking the question, post-op standard treatment, then gefitinib, then erlotinib or placebo. We are not asking to replace EGFR-TK inhibitor. We are not asking to replace chemotherapy with EGFR-TK inhibitors, and that's exactly what the Asian group is doing, where patients with EGFR uh, mutant uh, non-small cell lung cancer after resection will not get adjuvant therapy, will get either gefitinib or adjuvant therapy to ask the question, whether we, we can get it off the adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy at all in this population and use one legion fitinib. Ours is going one more step. We're going to eradicate, we're going to do chemotherapy that has been shown to benefit and then move on to give adjuvant therapy. So those two will actually answer this question. As I said, um, barring a few groups uh, that seem convinced about the role of this uh, using erlotinib in the adjuvant setting or crisodinib, probably much less, uh, we feel that most of us feel, or a good number of us feel that uh, these trials are the only way to answer this question. So I would ask your support and participation, and um, I hope you understood the basis behind this, and uh, hopefully we'll get the study done in the next four or five years, and that'll answer a lot of questions, including the genomic alterations in uh, several thousands of adenocarcinoma. I'll stop here and take any questions.